Chapter 5 Stealing Youth 1. He staggered through clean, geometric, empty, sound-deadening corridors. Doors did not drop for him. Twice he tried holding his plastic disc against what he thought were entrance plates. It was all he could think of, and it didn't work. Whatever this place was, he, or the dead man Corbell had robbed, was not authorized to pass these doors. The pressure suit became too heavy for him. He dropped it. He talked to the helmet, but it didn't answer. Where the hell was Pirsa? Corbell had freed Pirsa from all orders, past and future. Corbell had gone unprotected into an unknown environment, had later dropped out of communication. J.B. Corbell Mark II, missing, presumed dead. By now, Pierce could be rounding the sun on his way to some nearby star, searching for the state. Pierce's interstellar laser beam could have burned the old woman down as she crossed the street, but Corbell's computer had abandoned him, and Corbell hurled the helmet viciously into the cloud rug, but not as hard as he wanted, because his hands were still bound. The blind faceplate stared after him as he went on. His legs were starting to cramp. The clean air was turning musty with the old smell of something truly Drive dead safe. when Corbell came at last to an open door. He thought the mechanism had failed, and then he saw why. A small hole had been burned through the gold plate. Beyond the doorway was cruder damage and a richer smell. It had been a surgery, he guessed. At least, that looked like an operating table with machinery suspended above it. And the machinery included scalpels on jointed arms. There were crumbled brown skeletons. One, naked, lay in a pool of dust on the table. Two others sprawled against a wall. Their stained and damaged uniforms were in better shape than the bones within. Keep left. The cloth bore charred slashes that continued into the bones, as if men had been hacked by a white-hot sword. These men had been man-sized, Corbell's size. The wall behind the desk had a hole in it big enough to drive a car through. Bombs? It's all over now. Corbell heaved himself up on the table with the skeleton. He rubbed the bandages against his scalpel edge, and behold, his wrists were free. Now he moved to the great gap in the wall. He was getting his breath back, okay. but his heartbeat Here we was go. fast and fluttery. What he wanted most was a chance to lie down and rest, until he looked down into the vault. It was two stories high and windowless. To the left, a thick circle of metal almost the height of the wall with a stylized ship's wheel set in it. It looked for all the world like a bank vault door. There were guard posts, glass cubicles set just below the ceiling, and in the cubicles were skeletons armed with things like spotlights with rifle butts. A bank vault seemed out of place in a hospital. There were shelves on all three walls, floor to ceiling. The few items still on the shelves were not gold bars, they were bottles. The floor, ten feet below Corbell, was covered with broken glass. There was a half-melted metal thing, an animated dishwasher very like the machine that had attacked Corbell and Pierce as burglars. Other machinery looked intact. There was an instrument console that might have been, given the hospital motif, diagnostic equipment. There was a matched pair of transparent phone booths, glass cylinders with rounded tops. Corbell saw these and lusted. The invaders had brought a ladder. He climbed down carefully, treating himself as fragile. Four skeletons at the bottom showed that the invaders had not had things all their own way. He stepped carefully among the bones. As a hospital, the place made a good crypt. Better than most, in fact. Cool, Let's do clean. This. No insects, no scavengers, no fungus. But it wasn't death Corbell was running from. It was a silver cane, and a change more humiliating than death. The lights were still on in the vault. Indicator lights glowed on the console. With luck, the booths would work too. He stepped into one and looked for a dial. No dial, just a button set in a slender Turn post. right. No choice about where he was going. Corbell wondered if the Norn would be waiting at the other end. He made himself push the button anyway. Nothing happened. He cursed lurid, pushed out of the booth and tried the other. The second booth didn't even have a door and there was fine dust floating in. What the hell? What was Keep this place? Right, and then the rugs on the shelves up. must have been incredibly valuable. Four human guards and a metal killer. A single door that turn looked like it right. would stand off an atomic attack. 
an instant elsewhere booth with only one terminal and another booth you couldn't get out of. An invading army willing to go up against all that with bombs. And suddenly he knew where he must be. It was a double jolt. Those shelves must have held dictator immortality, and they were there. Everything fitted. Of course you'd store geriatric drugs in a hospital. The booths must lead directly to dictator strongholds, and even they could only appear in the closed booth. If the man in the booth wore the right face, someone outside could dial him into the booth that had a door. If not, he was a sitting duck for the laser weapon. And the vault door Keep might well right, stand an atomic and then attack. Turn right. But thieves had come through a wall, and maybe they'd used atomics too. Did Miralee Lyra know about this turn place? Right. She must. She'd have kept looking until she found it. And so would Corbell, and she knew it. The Norn herself had told him about dictator immortality. He had to get out of here. Exhaustion had become an agony. He would climb the ladder if he must, if he could. But he tried the vault door first. And it was open. All of his strength and weight were just enough to swing it wide. The invaders must have left by the door they could not enter. So did he, very gratefully. The line of phone booths was on this floor. He had walked a zigzag path from there. He might have trouble finding his way back. He saw the booths as he rounded a corner. And he saw Miralee Lyra Zelashishtha holding her cane like a gun and squinting at something in her other hand. Just before he ducked back, he saw her look up at the ceiling with her teeth bare. It wasn't him she was tracing. It was his pressure suit helmet. Here, sir. Goodbye. Corbell counted to 30, then stuck his nose around the corner. She wasn't there. He tiptoed through the cloud rug to the next intersection and peered around it. She wasn't there either, and he crossed the intersection at a leap and was in the nearest booth with the disc in his hand. Merely Lyra would not have liked the way he was smiling. Two commas crossed, an S Get reversed, ready to turn an hourglass on its side and pushed inward from the ends, a crooked pod. The corridors vanished. In blackness, he thumbed the door open turn and stepped left. out into blackness. A gust of warm, damp wind whipped at him, and at the same time he saw a dim light, a slender, hot pink crescent with the horns down, at eye level. He stood still while his eyes adjusted. A world took form around him. He was on a flat roof, looking into a solar eclipse. They must be fairly common these days, with both Sol and Jupiter occluding so much of the sky. But the effect was beautiful, a hot pink ring lighting sea and city with red dust. He wished he could stay. Merely Lyra must be finding his pressure suit helmet about now. There were stairs. He would have been happier knowing how tall the building was, but he didn't. He had to walk all the way to the bottom and he was reassured to recognize the building that housed Mirelli Lyra's office. He paused for a precious moment of rest, then climbed back up three flights. Next question, had the Norn noticed that the office door wasn't closed? The sixth door was open a crack, blocked by a fallen button. The door resisted his weight, then gave slowly, let him in. They must have turned these offices out like popcorn boxes, he thought. Did it connect to the exploded bedroom? He had bet his life on it. He stepped into the phone booth and looked for the intercom panel. Five buttons? He pushed the top one. Through the glass door, he saw salt dunes running down slope to a distant line of brilliant blue. He was in one of the seashore booths. He pushed the second button. Back in the office, he pushed number three. In red-tinged darkness, he saw a triangular floor plan. Walls and roof exploded outward. A dark donut shape coiled just where he would have stepped on it, raised a white face, questioningly. He shouted, Yeah! Go straight on. Weep. He jabbed the fourth button down. The startled Keep cattail right, vanished. Keep right, and then turn right. Sunken tub, shower. He thought of hot water and comfort and sleep, and the hell with it. Would the old woman set her private right. zero-time jail next to a Turkish bath? Why not? But he pushed the bottom button anyway, to see what there was to see. Thoughts of sleep returned. His knees sagged. His muscles and bones seemed to be melting. But he saw ovens and cupboards to left and right, a long dining table, floating, and lines of floating chairs. The hooded Norn at the far Go end, straight on. and the silver cane foreshortened, end on. 
Behind her, shards of a picture window and a bundle of thick cables running over the sill. He stabbed two buttons and kicked out at the door. Two. He was trying to remember something. It was urgent. See now, I hit an intercom button, then the door button, then kick out. Or the other way around. Intercom door kick out. Didn't wait, couldn't wait. Never thought so fast in my life. Pressure on his ankles. He thrashed a bit, got his elbows under him to lift his head. The door of the phone booth was trying to lift under his ankles. Beyond, the great red sun was almost whole again, a chunk still missing behind black Jupiter. Closer, a desk floated above cloud run. He smiled and closed his eyes. It was seconds or minutes before he stirred himself. The sun was still cut by Jupiter. He stood on the edge of the door while he looked for something to wedge it. He'd got out by the skin of his teeth. With the silver cane pushing him down into unconsciousness, he'd hit the intercom button to take him to the office, the button to open the door, then got his legs across the door to wedge it. So far, so good. But assume the Norn was still guarding her zero-time device and her drug supply. He hadn't seen the marvelous machine. He couldn't even guess what it looked like. But what else could the cables be for? It must be there. And now, merely Lyra knew he was after her drugs. By now, she would know that the intercom to the office Go straight wasn't on. working. She would assume Corbell had blocked the door open. He couldn't let the door close. She'd be out of it an instant later, right on his heels. Corbell began to panic. He'd barred her from the general phone booth system by barring her from the office. She couldn't use that. She couldn't come after him in the car. They'd left it here, just outside the entrance. So, yeah. Her fastest route to him was by intercom to the beach. Jog down to someone else's intercom booth, thence to someone else's office, dial for this building. By now she could be trotting down from the roof, and he still hadn't found anything to block the door. He stripped off his undersuit and wedged it in the door. It was cool for a moment until the sweat dried on him. Now he was naked and ashamed. What he saw when he looked down was not a self to be proud of. But who would see him okay. but merely Lyra? Let's find a the new old route. woman was probably in no better shape. His personal possessions had dwindled to an ancient withered body, stolen, and a single plastic credit card disc, also stolen. He took them down three flights of stairs and out. The car was where they had left it. It wouldn't start. He looked for a key or a key slot. If the Norn had taken the key, he would have to walk. He found a slot, empty and said a bad word before he noticed its size. The plastic disc fitted perfectly. The cars must be public taxis. That was convenient. Now, if the car's destination codes resembled the booths, all he had to do was punch for the police station and get a gun. As he reached for the keyboard, his hands started to shake. Then other muscles were twitching, and suddenly he was in convulsions. Strange noises came from his mouth. In fury and despair, Corbell realized that the felon's corpse had finally failed him. He was dying, and the timing was wrong, wrong. Please, no, not till the battle's over. He locked his hands together and forced them at the keyboard. He punched the compressed hourglass, tried again and missed, again and hit, had to stop for a minute. Neck muscles locked and twisted his head backward, agonizingly, and he saw a car coming around the gently curved drive like a homing missile. The convulsions were getting worse. He stabbed at the hourglass key Go again straight on. and again, and he didn't know how often he'd hit it. When the car began to move, he let the convulsions have their way. Mental agony, unconsciousness, now convulsions. Maybe he ought to be compiling a list of what the silver cane wouldn't do. It wouldn't stop a bubble car. The convulsions eased. Presently, he Go turned straight his on. head. Merely Lyra was far behind him, out of her car, still firing. His motion carried him around the curve of the drive. He tried to relax. Random muscles locked and released in his legs, his back, his neck, his eyelids. He wasn't just feeling the after effects of the silver cane. He had been through too much nightmare. He was too old for this kind of thing. He had always been too old to play monster and villagers through a maze of cityscape with an armed madwoman behind him. Come on, calm down, he whispered. It's all over. Unless... Unless there was a tracking device in Mirelle Lyra's dashboard, or in her cane. He would still get there ahead of him. 
allow, say, one minute to search the police station for a gun, then cut his losses, get out via the booths, dial at random, and keep running. Oops, the booths didn't work. He had tried to dial the police Go station straight early. on. The car tilted far over, rounded a corner, and was on one of the radial streets. Corbell watched the rear, his chin propped on the back of the seat. It was less unnerving than watching rubble come at him. He saw the edge of the hexagonal dome go past him. The street ended. He was crossing sand. Corbell turned to see barren salt dunes blowing past him. Far ahead, the blue and white line of ocean came toward him. The car ran straight toward frothing white breakers, crossed them, and headed out to sea at something like 90 miles per hour. 3. Her voice was a rusty, querulous whine. He didn't like it. It was interfering with his search. It said, All right, Corbell, you won the argument. If your medicines were better, you wouldn't have tried to steal mine. Now, let's talk. It wasn't much of a search. He had hoped that Miralee Lyra might have stored food in her car. But he'd opened the glove compartment, and he'd looked under the seats, and where else was there? Slit the upholstery? Corbell was hungry. You'll find the talking switch on the far right of the panel. Just push it upward. Corbell? Sure, and then you'll track me down, man. But Corbell was tempted. He could ask her about food. He could ask her how to turn off the receiver. The car zipped over the waves toward whatever destination its idiot brain had read from Corbell's spastic directions. Beneath the edges of a thick, gray-black cloud deck, the sun and crescent Jupiter had drifted apart along the horizon. The sun was lower now, its underside flattened. Something lifted out of the red sun glare. He thought it was a bottlenose dolphin until its size registered. It was halfway to the horizon and lifting like a blimp released. Its head tilted just a bit and it looked him over while it slowly settled back into the frothing red sea. A dolphin the size of a whale. So we killed the whales off after all, he thought. And later there was an ecological niche. I must guess you're hearing me, Corbell. I'm tracking you toward the southernmost continent, toward what used to be the boys' capital city. You can't lose me from your path because you can't leave your car. Talk to me. It seemed she was tracking him anyway. He flipped the switch off and said, Is there any food aboard this car? Hello, Corbell. If you try to steal my drugs again, you will kill yourself. I've placed traps. Then I won't. Then we will be searching in separate places. I give you a year to find the dictator immortality. I wish I could give more, but you know my condition. If you will find the drug, I will become your woman. Otherwise, I will kill you. Right, and he then laughed. turn right. A difficult choice. You have not seen me when I was beautiful. I am the only woman for you, turn Corbell. Right. There are no others left. Don't count on too much. Hirsa says I'm low on sex urge. That upset her. Have you never desired women, Corbell? I was married for 22 years. What is married? Mated, under contract. Was there sex? Did you enjoy it? Suddenly, Corbell missed Mirabel terribly. He mourned her, not because she was dead, but because she was gone. And her other half went on and on through a world grown more and more hallucinatory. If only he could have talked it over with Mirabel. In sex, and in all ways, our life was purest ecstasy, as is usual in marriage, Corbell said with a flippancy he did not feel. I'm sorry I brought it up. I had to know. Just to stick a pin in her, he said, Has it ever occurred to you that I might not want the dictator immortality? Maybe I'm content to grow old gracefully. You tried to steal my drugs. You've got me there. There is no grace to growing old. One year, Corbell. Hey, don't hang up. Have you any idea where I'm headed? I don't even know where we were. There is a continent that covers the South Pole. You are aimed there. As for where we were, there is a continent whose long tip points at the southernmost continent. We were nearly at the tip. I suspect your target to be the city of... Sarash Zilish, the capital of Earth's last civilization. Departing Cape Horn for Antarctica, he thought. Where in Antarctica? What destination did you type? He risked telling her. 
I was trying to get to the police station. What with the way my muscles were jumping around, I really don't know what I hit. Could you have struck Keep the key more than four times? And then turn Five left. would send you to World Police Headquarters in Seresh Zilish. Maybe. He laughed. Well, it got me turn away from left. you. One year, Corbel. In a year, he could be dead. Though, in fact, he felt pretty good. The aches, the exhaustion, the twitchies were going away. But the hunger had attained a fine cutting edge. In an hour, I'll be dead of starvation. Is there any food in this car? No. What do I eat? When you reach Keep Sarash left. Zilish, go to the park. She gave him an address for the keyboard of his taxi. The park is untended now, but any fruits you find are edible, and most of the animals can be eaten if you can catch them. Okay. You will not find dictator immortality there. There were never adults in Sarash Zilish. Hey. Merely Lyra, how long have you been looking? Perhaps ten years of my life? He was startled. I got the impression you'd been at it for a century or so. I was unlucky. When the children revived me from zero time, they told me they would search out the dictator immortality for me. I had no choice but to believe them. But they lied. There was a vault in the hospital. She laughed. There is a vault in every hospital, in every city that remains on Earth. I have searched them all. What vaults haven't been rifled contain nothing but poisons. The medicines have decayed with time and wet heat. Tell me more. What did you learn about this dictator immortality after you landed, before they locked you up? Almost nothing. Only that it was there. Tell me. Tell me all the wrong answers, so I don't have to waste my time on them. Four. The children had been waiting when Mirali Lyra descended from her spacecraft. Her first guess was that they must be the result of a state breeding program. Dignified, self-possessed, articulate, they displayed an adult wisdom she took for supernormal intelligence. Later, she realized that it was the result of lifetimes of experience. She had never seen their life. They had never seen hers. There were adults in the world, but they were a separate breed. She never met any, but she gathered that there were no more than a few thousand of them, all dictator class by courtesy, all using the dictator immortality. They kept themselves apart from the billions of children. Children, boys and girls together, integrated. She thought nothing of it then. Later, she remembered. The children tried her by her own law for treason. She gained the impression that the proceedings were a farce for their amusement. Perhaps that was paranoia. They were punctilious. They did not mock her. They did not deviate from laws 70,000 years old. For her part, Merrily Lyra kept her dignity at all times, as she was at pains to inform Corbell. They sentenced her to the zero time jail. Didn't you ever hear anything about the interstellar colonies? No, nothing. It figures. They must have broken away from the state long before you landed. That's probably why they fired on you. Not because you were merely Lyra, but because you were from Earth. There was a silence. Then... I never understood that. Are you saying that the state broke apart? Yeah. It took a hell of a long time, that's all. The state was a water monopoly empire. Corbell was talking half to himself now. They tend to last forever unless something comes in from outside and breaks them up. But there wasn't anything outside the state. The collapse had to wait till the state made its own barbarians. Hesitantly, nearly Lyra said, You talk as if you have known many kinds of state. I predate the state. I was a corpsicle, a frozen dead man. When the state was a century or so old, they turned a condemned criminal into Jerome Corbell. Oh. Pause. Then maybe you know more than I do. How could the state break apart? Look at it this way. First there was the state expanding through the solar system. Later, much later, there were a lot of copies of the state, one for each star, all belonging to one big state run from Earth. Then, well, I'm guessing, I think it was children's immortality. You made a big thing out of the advantages of making 11-year-olds immortal. Okay, fine. What if the other states didn't accept that? Look at how different your children's state would be. 
The other states probably claimed they were the original state. That makes the solar system state heretics, its citizens unbelievers. What would happen then? Would they stop talking to each other? Corbell laughed. Sure, right after the war, right after both sides tried to exterminate each other and failed. That's got to be the way it happened. It's inevitable. Keep laughing. Why? It just is. Then, she said slowly, that's what happened to... What? When they took me out of zero time, there was more than one state on Earth. Maybe that was inevitable, too. Let me tell you. The children led Mirali Lyra to the peak of a squat silver pyramid. Widgets of silver and clear plastic floated around her. Three-dimensional television transmitters right. and weapons that affected the mind and will. They turned off the pyramid. Its mirror-colored sides became black iron. They put her in an elevator and sent her down. She joined a despondent rabble. Keep right. Some tried to talk to her in gibberish. She watched the elevator rise and sink again with another prisoner. None spoke her language. The elevator never stopped rising and falling, bringing prisoners down, rising empty. The styles of those about her were wildly different. They continued to change with every new prisoner. There was no provision for feeding the prisoners. It became obvious. Nobody had been here long enough to become hungry. The twelfth to descend was not a prisoner. A girl of eleven dropped just above their heads. Small machines floated around her. One, a silver wand mounted in a larger base, twitched this way and that like a nervous hound eager to be loosed. The girl was naked and strangely decorated. Transparent butterfly wings sprang from her shoulders. She called in a sweet, peremptory, oddly accented voice, Mirali Lyra Zilashista, are you there? So, Mirali Lyra returned to the world after perhaps a quarter of an hour of subjective time. Her hosts were half a dozen children, all girls. The girl who had come for her, Chos, was in some ways Keep the leader. Right. And Their social organization right. was complex. Their minds were not the minds of children. They walked like the lords of exit the world. Right. Mirali Lyra's translator gave Corbell her emotional inflections as well Keep as her left. words. And then the emotions turn were left. awe and fear and hatred. These were not little turn girls. Left. They were girls, neuter and immortal. They were arrogant and indulgent by turns. And Mirali Lyra learned to obey them. They trained her with the floating silver wand, a variant of the silver cane she carried much later. The box she carried constantly at her belt was the same translator she carried now. They made her wear it long after she knew the language. They thought her accent ugly. It grated on her to think that they regarded her as a social inferior. Later, she changed her mind. They regarded her as a house pet, a prized property that could do tricks. With the children, she watched shows put on by other groups of children. Some they attended live. Others were broadcast as three-dimensional illusions, like holovision sets arbitrarily large. Once they floated in interplanetary space for hours, and Mirali Lyra wondered at the grim intensity with which Chaucer's girls watched a dull and repetitious planetarium show. She understood their rapt concentration later, during the voting. But most of the shows were bids for prestige. Some of the bulky floating widgets that followed her around were cameras and emotional sensors. Mirali Lyra was another show. Because of her, the prestige of Chaucer's group was high. Her medicines had retarded, but not prevented, menopause. The change in her body was a near-killing blow to Mirali Lyra's faith in herself. She was a trained seal and aging. One thing kept her going. Somewhere out there was dictator immortality. At first, she welcomed the chance to talk to the girls. But that was the trouble. Mirali Lyra did all the talking. Her own questions were not answered. Questions the girls put to her, she was expected to answer in full. If she didn't lecture at length, they became annoyed. Then, once, she found Chos in an indulgent mood. Chos told me that the dictators took care of their own medical problems said Mirali Lyra. The dictators were ruled by the boys, who made shows with them and saw to it that chemicals in their food kept them from having children. I think Chos was jealous that the boys would not let girls play with the dictators. I'm telling this badly, she said suddenly. These girls were all older than I. 
They were decadent aristocrats, not children. Yeah, I get the impression the girls and the boys stayed apart. Yeah, and that made it difficult for me. The boys and girls, they didn't have sex to hold them together. They were two separate states on Earth, each with its territory and its rights. They must have been separate for a long time. Choss said that the girls ruled the sky and the boys ruled the dictators. I would have to go to the boys to find out about dictator immortality. The girls ruled the sky? That sounded like nonsense, but Choss said so. I think it was true, Corbell. I saw them vote not to move the Earth. We watched an astronomical light show, and then there were hours of discussion, and they voted. But I was more concerned with dictator immortality. Choss promised to learn what I wanted from the boys. I was valuable to them, Corbell. They gained prestige from the stories I told and the shows they made about me. Anger crackled in the translator's voice as merely Lyra relived evil memories. They were forever amused by what I did not know. Other groups of girls began reviving other prisoners. After many years, I decided that Choss had done nothing to get me what I wanted. I would have to reach the boys. It figures. What? Choss couldn't go to the boys. They'd claim you as a dictator. Their property. I never thought of that. I was a fool. Go on. The boys held the land masses of the southern hemisphere. They had built heated domes in the south polar continent. They held two other continents and many islands. But the girls ruled more useful land and more power too, if they really ruled the sky. I knew that the earth had been moved. There were times when Jupiter shone so brilliantly that one could see the banding and pick out the moons. I was afraid of these girls. I was trying to find a safe way to steal an aircraft, but I waited too long. One day, Chas told me that they were tired of me, that I must go back in zero time. I was no longer a new thing. I took a plane that night. They let me fly a long way before they brought me back with the autopilot. I learned that they had made a show of my escape. Fun people, your girls. They put you back in the box? Yes. They let me keep my translator. It was the only thing they did for me. Later, they lowered two boys they had caught during a fight. The girls had given them soul whips, she said with grim amusement. And I was the only one who could talk to them. Soul whip? I used one to make you docile. It didn't work. A few more applications may help. Finish your story. We waited a long time. Nobody came to free us. Finally, the machinery stopped. Everything was killing hot. The boys ruled us with the soul whip, and I was their translator, but there was little cooperation. Some of us lived to reach the southernmost continent. There, they were captured by boys, all but me. I fled back across the water alone. It was a long time before I learned enough to feel myself safe. I had to learn what could be eaten, what foods would not spoil, how to hide from storms. All things you will have to learn, too. I was old when I could begin searching again. For ten years, I searched for dictator immortality through the ruins the boys and girls left me. Then I emptied out my small zero-time storage place and went into it to wait for you. Nice try. When you are young again, then mock me. I don't expect that will happen. We can't give up. Corbell laughed. I can give up. I guess I don't believe in your dictator immortality. Have you ever seen anyone get young? No, but... Do you even know what makes people get old? Fires don't burn backward, lady. I am not a doctor. I only know what anyone knows. Inert molecules gather in the cells to clog them, like, like silt and garbage, and the poisons of industry gather in a great inland sea, until the sea becomes a great inland Go straight swamp. On. The cells become less active. Some die. One day, there are too Keep few left, active cells living too slowly. Left. Other inert matter accumulates to block the veins and arteries. Turn left. But I have medicines to dissolve them. Cholesterol, sure. But getting the dead stuff out of a living cell without killing it would be something else again. I think you were hoaxed, said Corbell. Choss and her friends acted like nasty children. Why not your boy lawyer, Keep too? Right. Remember, and then you asked right. the girls. They didn't raise the subject. But why? Oh, just to see what Turn you... right. No! Everyone dies. Your lawyer's dead. Choss is dead. Even civilizations die. 
There was a civilization here that could move the Earth. Now there's nothing. After a longish silence came the calm voice of the translating box. There are boys where you're going. I tried to talk to them once. They know nothing of dictator immortality. Do they know what happened to civilization? You said it yourself. There were two states on Earth. They must have fought. It could have happened. War between the sexes had always seemed silly to Corbell. Too much fraternizing with the enemy. Ha ha. But if sex didn't hold them Never together... Never mind. Rerouting. The boys know nothing. She Finding repeated. a recomputing. Perhaps there was never dictator immortality in the South Polar continent. You've got a one-track mind. If it ever existed, you found it in every city in the world. Used up. Rotted. One year, Corbell. Might as well try it. How does this sound? Let me use your medicines. I can travel faster and look further if I'm young and healthy. Another long pause. Then... Yes, that makes sense. Keep I thought right, you'd say no. And then turn Here right. was his chance. But... Nuts. No, I just can't risk it. You scare me too much. Turn this right. way at least I get a year. She screamed something that was not translated. The receiver went dead. A year, he thought. In a year, I'll be dug in so deep, she'll never find me at all. Chapter 6 The Changelings 1. Corbell came to the Antarctic shore in near darkness. The vanished sun had left dark red splashed across the northern horizon, and a red-on-red -red circle that was Jupiter's night side. To east and west, he picked out tiny Jovian moons. Ahead, dark woods came down to a dark shore. The trees came at him, spreading out. Then the smooth ride was bouncing Brownian motion, and the car was dodging tree trunks at maniac speed. He gripped the padded bar to keep himself from bouncing around inside. He dared not close his eyes. The chase scenes through Four City should have burned away his capacity for terror. Keep but right, they and then turn they right. The old trees forced their way through a tangle of burgeoning life, vines, Underbrush, big mushrooms, Turn right. everything living on each other. A pair of huge birds ran screaming from the car. The car rode high, but branches slashed at its underside. The forest thinned and showed masonry half hidden in vines. The car was already racing through Serash Zilish. Soil and grass and small bushes had invaded the streets. If this was Three City, if this was the Antarctic source of industrial activity Pierce had sensed from orbit, then it was far gone. The car was slowing. Thank God. It scraped slowly over crackling brush, stopped in the open, and sank. Corbell got out onto moist grass. He stretched. He looked about him. In the darkness, it was barely possible to pick out two distant curved walls of hexagonal filigree where a dome must have stood. Corbell found no sign of the great black cube, the subway station that had been the center of every city he'd seen so far. He was parked beside what must be World Police Go straight on. A great wall of balconies and dark windows, with a row of large circular holes at the top, holes big enough to be access ports for flying police cars. There must be weapons in there. But there was certainly food in the park, and Corbell was faint with hunger. With some reluctance, he climbed back into the car and tapped out the number Murali Lyra had given him. Inverted L, inverted L, nameless squiggle, Delta. Like the woods beyond the city, the park was spreading into the streets. The car stopped over a patch of tangled vines. He stepped out, having precious little choice, and found himself thigh deep in the tough vines. They pulled him back like a nest of snakes. He waded out. Hunger had never done anything for Corbell's disposition. Go straight on. It made him irritable, unfit to live with. A wall of greenery twice his height ended just ahead of him. On the theory that there was a real wall under that tangle of vines, Corbell walked to the end, turned, and entered the park proper. There was no obvious difference. It was as dark as the inside of a mouth. Jupiter's horizontal light couldn't reach through trees and buildings. Corbell wished for a flashlight or a torch, but he didn't even have a match. Corbell Mark II, bare-ass naked against the wilderness would not be hunting prey tonight. But fruit now. Finding a new These route. These could be fruit trees. 
The Norn had said they were. Corbell stood beneath a tree and ran his hands through the branches. Something round bounced against his wrist. It was pear-shaped, bigger than a pear, with thick, rough skin. With his teeth, he stripped some of the covering away. He bit into creamy avocado flesh, milder in taste than avocado. He ate it all. He threw away the skin and pit and felt through the branches for another. A furry tentacle dropped familiarly around his neck. Corbell grabbed. Sharp teeth closed between his neck and shoulder. The pain sickened him. His closing right hand slipped along fur, was stopped by a thickening, a head. He wrenched at it. The teeth came loose. The tentacle came loose and immediately wrapped new loops around his forearm. By starlight, he saw a small, snarling face. He was strangling Go a cat straight tail. on. The little beast could as easily have torn his eyes or his jugular. It was trying to bite him now. Even so, he didn't especially want to kill it. He banged its head against a branch. Its grip loosened. A pitcher's fastball gesture flung it away. It coiled on the ground, lifted a head to study it. He was too big. It went away. He had suffered a muscle tissue wound, but it wasn't bleeding badly. Still, it hurt. Corbell sent a curse to follow the cat tail. He found and ate two more avocados. Good enough. He went back to the car, locked himself in, and went to sleep. The first day, Corbell made his breakfast on tiny apples and apple-sized grapefruit. The cattails had disappeared. He sat quietly while he ate and was rewarded. Squirrels, maybe, they moved fast, popped into view and vanished. A bird ran out of the woods, stopped short in front of him. It was as tall as his shoulder, dressed in the autumn colors of a turkey, squawked in terror and fled. Presently, he picked up a thick branch, knobbed at the end. A machete was what he really had but the club had a nice heft. He went exploring. The park was a jungle of delights. He found fruit trees and nut trees, and trees that grew fist-sized, warty things whose taste he would have to try later. Pineapples and coconut palms fought for room. String beans grew on vines that were strangling some of the trees. On a hunch, Corbell pulled up some smaller plants and found fat roots, potatoes or carrots or yams, maybe. Go he was seeing on. them by reddened light. For a million years, they had been adapting to that Keep reddened right, light and, and the 12-year Antarctic right. day. Of course, they were unrecognizable, but they might be Never edible mind. If, you I'll find them, a re if you could start a fire or find one. The ground floor Keep of World right, Police Headquarters and then was clean and right. empty. Corbell found no dead bodies, no guns left lying about, no uniforms. Even the desks were gone. He was disappointed. He had hoped at least to clothe himself. He tried an elevator. It worked. Over several hours of exploring, he found that the 20-story building was bare to the walls, from the empty hangars under the rooftop landing pad, to the wonderfully filigreed cells in the fifth through seventh floors, to the offices on the second. Nothing remained that wasn't part of the structure itself. But the elevators worked. He kept looking. Where desks had been, he found slots for trash. He tracked them to their outlet, metal trash cans, empty. He carried a can out to the car. It was the closest thing he'd found to a cooking pot. Now, if he could find water and fire. He'd already been through the big room on the 10th floor. There was an acre of flat surface in here, tabletop along all four sides, a big square table in the middle with bins under it, doors with shelves behind them. Now, searching more carefully, he opened long panels and found knobs under them. He turned all the knobs as far as they could go, hoping to turn on a burner. This could be a kitchen. He went down to the car. He came back with a generous armful of dried grass and the club. Most of the kitchen mechanisms must have stopped working. A snug and solid door proclaimed a cupboard to be a refrigerator. Some of the flat surfaces had to be riddles, but they weren't hot. A small glass door with a shelved recess behind it was hot. An oven. Corbell stuffed the grass into it and waited and waited, while the grass smoldered, smoldered more, and suddenly burned. He opened the door and set the club in the burning grass. When the grass burned out, the knob on the end was barely smoldering. By then, Corbell had found an exhaust fan. He let that blow on the coals until he had a small flame. The rain started as he reached the car. The car refused to move unless the doors were closed, with the club inside with Corbell smoldering. The small flame had gone out. The rain fell tremendously, 
as if it wouldn't stop until the world was all water. Smoke inside and rain outside. Corbell couldn't see at all. Fortunately, the ride was short. The car settled over the exact same patch of tangled vines. Corbell pushed the trash can out into the rain, but he stayed in the car with the doors open, blowing on the coals. The afternoon rain went on and on. When the club stopped smoldering, Corbell didn't care. All the wood in the park would be soaked by now. He waded out into the wet and got his dinner of assorted fruits before the light was quite gone. Again he slept in the car. A cramped, damp, wakeful night followed a miserable day. In this jungle of delights, this wilderness in which everything that grew seemed intended to serve man, Corbell had failed to make fire, even with the help of a kitchen oven. Robinson Crusoe would have sneered. But the cattail bite was healing. No fever. He had escaped rabies and tetanus. Tomorrow. Try again tomorrow. The second day was bigger, better, faster. He took the car to World Police Headquarters. He carried two armfuls of damp scavenged wood into an elevator and up to the kitchen. He put them in the oven. He'd forgotten to turn it off yesterday. It saved him time now. Go straight on. He turned on the exhaust and left. A little searching found him a second trash can. He took it up. The logs were smoldering, burning in places, but still wet. He left them to it. The kitchen was full of smoke, despite the exhaust fan. Impatience got to him. There were not even flames on the blackened logs now. Okay. He opened the oven door. Let's find a new air. route. The gases caught with a soft whoosh. Corbell leapt back, slapping at his hair and eyebrows. But no, they hadn't caught. He had to tear a door off a narrow cupboard. It was the only tool he could find. With the door, he hurried the logs out of the oven and into the trash can. He took the cupboard door along, too. Flat metal, it might serve somehow. His way back to the park was slower. Three times he had to open a door to let out the smoke. Each time the car slowed as if it had rammed invisible taffy. But he got Keep back left, and maneuvered and the trash can left. out of the car into the patch of vines, under a threatening sky. The logs had gone to cold. He turned the can on its side and placed the left. bottom higher than the lip. He pushed the coals into a pile at the back. He found more wood, not too damp, which he set in the trash can to be dried by the heat. When the warm rain opened up on him, it didn't bother him. It was not especially uncomfortable, and now his fire was safe. This time a million years ago, this time two million years ago, Corbell the Spaceman had already crossed tens of thousands of light years, and at the core of the galaxy was skirting the edge of a black hole, massive as a hundred million suns. Corbell the Naked Savage went forth to hunt his dinner. Living things rustled around him, but he saw nothing. It didn't matter. He didn't have anything to kill with, not so much as a kitchen knife. He kept his eyes open for another club while he pulled up roots. He pulled up quite a number of different roots. He'd roast them all and taste them. He spent more time gathering nuts. The rain stopped. This rain seemed regular enough, starting just after noon, lasting two or three hours. It was nice to be able to count on something. In the customary red sunset light, he sat down to cook his dinner. He had to throw away half the roots. He got, in rough and approximate terms, Keep one right potato, one and very large exit beef, right. a combination yam and carrot, and a more nearly pure yam. He burned most of the nuts, but exit some survived. Right and were delicious, he went back for more. Then night was upon him. He set the trash can upright and set some dead tree limbs in the coals and settled down to sleep in a patch of nearly dry moss. The third day. Corbell half woke in darkness. He felt fur and a warm spot against his back, but elsewhere he was chilled. He curled more tightly around himself and went back to sleep. Sometime later, the memory snapped him awake. Fur. There was nothing against his back now. A dream? Or had a friendly cattail stretched against him for warmth? The touch hadn't wakened him fully. He and Mirabelle used to share their king-sized bed with a kitten until the kitten became a tomcat and started behaving like one. Well, he was awake now. He did easy exercises until the stiffness was gone. He breakfasted on fruit. What else? Perhaps he ought to be looking for nests and eggs. The fire was still going. He built it up with twigs, then went looking for larger pieces. He wished for an axe. The little stuff burned too fast. The big stuff was too heavy to move. 
and he would soon use up all the dead limbs in the area. He spent part of the morning dragging a huge limb to his replenished fire. After he had tilted the trash can on its side and pushed the big end of the limb into it, he decided he'd created the fire hazard. He moved the whole arrangement onto a nearly buried outcropping of granite. It was meat he hungered for. If he could find a straight sapling, perhaps he could fire harden it into a spear, provided he could sharpen a point. What he really needed was a knife, he thought. For that alone, it was worth exploring Serash Zilish. Four crossed comets brought the car to the Serash Zilish hospital. Corbell recognized it at once. From outside, it was identical to the Four City Hospital. Civilization must have become awfully stereotyped before its collapse. Corbell fantasized a great pogrom in which all the world's architects had died. Afterward, humanity had been reduced to copying he older left. buildings detail for detail. It didn't make a lot of sense. He'd look for other reasons for the duplication he saw everywhere. Inside, the place kept reminding him of his nightmare flight from Mirali Lyra. Clean corridors, doors with no handles, cloud rug. The only difference was the lack of a vault. He found a central place, a two-story room lined with shelves and occupied by a computer that must be diagnostic equipment. But there was no vault door and no double phone booth, no precautions against thieves, no mummified losers. If Mirali Lyra had not lied, the boys had owned this city. They would not have needed to steal dictator immortality. Only dictators, adults, would need that. He found more locked doors, which would open with a kick. He found an operating room, two flat tables with straps attached, and clusters of jointed arms above them, tipped with scalpels and suction tubes and needles and clamps. The metal showed the stains of neglect and age. The stiffly extended insectile arm, that was his target. Corbell climbed up on a table, leaned out to grip the arm at its end. He swung outward and hung suspended. The arm sagged, then broke in the middle and dropped him to the floor. Corbell the hunter left the hospital carrying three feet of metal spear with a scalpel at the end. Again the rains caught him on the way back. He made his way to his fireplace, checked to see that the fire was still going then sat down to wait it out. There were several inches of water in his other trash barrel. He was killing time by trying to shave, very carefully, but the weight of the handle was awkward, and he wasn't doing a good job of it. When he saw the giant turkey, it was pecking under a nut tree, looking bedraggled and unhappy. He froze. It hadn't seen him. He debated as to whether he might sneak up on it. Probably not. He eased forward onto the balls of his feet, spear held lightly in both hands. He sprinted. The bird looked up, squawked, turned and fled. Corbell swung the spear and chopped at its foot. The bird stopped to peck at whatever had bitten it. Corbell chopped again at the neck and felt the satisfying shock in his shoulders. The bird was hurt and in panic. It ran in clumsy circles, squawking, while Corbell chased it. He got two more shots at the neck and then he had to stop, gasping, his pulse thundering in his ears. The bird was spouting blood. It hadn't slowed down, but its flight was brownie in motion, sheer blind panic. It had not gone far when Corbell recovered his breath and resumed the chase. He was moving in for the kill when the bird turned and ran straight at him. A lucky swing as he sprawled backward, and the bird was headless. It ran right over him and kept going. He tracked it until it fell over. The patch of bare rock was nearly dry. Corbell spilled his fire across it, added more wood, then went back for the bird. He pulled feathers until he was exhausted, rested, pulled more feathers. He opened the bird's belly and cleaned it, tugging two-handed at internal organs, his feet braced on rough rock. The cupboard door from the police station became his griddle. He fried the liver on it and ate it while parts of the rest of the bird were roasting. Afterward, he worked at cutting into the joints. He couldn't build his fire big enough to roast the whole bird, but he could roast a drumstick and broil thick slices of breast on a stick. Meat. It was good to taste meat again. There was far too much for tonight. He had roasted both drumsticks. He could eat them cold tomorrow. He could cut up parts of the carcass and boil them for soup in the other trash can with some of the roots. Two. The northeast was turning gray, but in the black northwestern sky, one star still glowed. Corbell had watched it on several nights. 
It did not twinkle, and it did not move against the stellar background. Go straight that on. That made it a planet, a big object dimly lit, possibly the world whose skewed orbit had disturbed Pirsa. Keep Now right. it twinkled. Now it was marginally brighter. Corbell blinked, just his imagination. Now it was fading before the coming dawn. Corbell closed his eyes. He didn't want to wake up. There was no special reason why he should. He wasn't hungry or uncomfortable. He'd learned much about the empty city during these past 20 days, but there were mysteries still to be explored. His encampment had become comfortable. He had a fireplace, a soup pot, and the car for shelter. He had tools. He had used a scalpel to carve wooden cooking implements. He didn't need clothes. For two full days, he had practiced throwing rocks and taken his reward in squirrel meat. Yesterday, he had killed another giant turkey, his third. Big deal. Obscurely depressed, he curled tighter in his bed of moss. Corbell the architect and Corbell the interstellar explorer seemed equally dead. In his pride, he had called himself a naked savage, but he wasn't that. A savage has his duties to the tribe, his tribe's duties to him. He has legends. Songs, dances, rules of conduct. Howdy, howdy. And uncommitted women. A place for him when he grows old. Hey, no. But Corbell was alone. He could make fire with the help of a super sophisticated kitchen. He could feed himself now that practically everything he could touch was edible. Some part. In the beginning, it must have held only food plants and meat animals. City surrounding a farm. The cattails would hardly have survived vain and decorative though they were, in the presence of real predators. Dome cities. Merely Lyra had spoken of the boys building dome cities, here in land that the more powerful girls hadn't held. But of course, Sarash Zilish must have been domed against blizzards and sub-zero cold, before the world turned unaccountably hot. As for the park, the Keep boys left. could hardly have grown beans and citrus fruit in the permafrost outside. The girls ruled the sky, controlled Earth's orbit. They must have made a mistake somewhere. What could have turned Jupiter into a minor sun? It must have shocked the girls as badly as it later shocked Pearson. It must have, because the change left boy territory habitable and made girl territory into scalding deserts, overturning a balance of power tens or hundreds of thousands of years old. Corbell shifted, then sat up. Keep left. It was the present that ought to concern him. Three cattails were tearing at his turkey carcass. When he moved, they jolted to attention. Corbell reconsidered his first intention. They were eating the raw meat. They had left the roasted drumsticks alone. That left plenty of meat for Corbell. They studied him. Three snakes with solemn cat faces, furred in brown and orange, intricately patterned as beautiful as three butterscotch sundaes. Corbell smiled and gestured hospitably. As if they understood, they went back to their meal. Breakfast. He ate fruit and drumstick meat and thought about coffee. Afterward, he tended his fire. The scalpel was razor sharp despite age and 18 days of blunting, but it was no ax. He went far afield to find wood. The exercise was good. Decades in the cold sleep coffin had preserved him better than he had hoped. He'd gone soft despite the exercises, but the savage life was toning him up. He took the other trash can to what had been a fountain and was now a pond, filled it with not especially clean water, dragged it back and wrestled it into place over the fire. He turned to the turkey carcass. He cut chunks small enough to fit the trash can. Meat gnawed by cattails went in, and so did bare bones. While it heated, he foraged for roots to flavor the soup. Potatoes, carrot yams. He found nothing that resembled an onion, unfortunately. He added beans and, experimentally, a couple of grapefruit. He stirred it all with a wooden paddle. As usual, noon looked like sunset, which was endlessly disconcerting. Corbell rested. The water was beginning to bubble. Granite was uncomfortable beneath his buttocks. Corbell was mildly depressed, and he couldn't understand why. And then he did. Last day of a camping trip. You've worked your tail off. Keep your left. Your belt has come in a notch and a half. 
You haven't had to think much. You've seen some magnificent scenery. There were damn few people on the trails, and they didn't rub your nerves. It's been good, but now it's back to work. Merely Lyra knew where he was. Keep left. He was healthier than he'd known. He could live a Jovian year if nothing killed him. The tourist in him liked that thought. The mad old woman had promised him one year, an old earth year. He could believe as much of that as he cared to, but a sane man would choose the jungle. Could a man survive in the jungle outside Sarash Zilish? It would depend. Corbell had come to Antarctica in either spring or fall of a year 12 years long. An old earth year from now, the day might last 23 hours, or one. It would be much warmer than this, or much colder. For the world still had its tilt and its 24-hour rotation. Odd that the girls had not corrected that. But maybe they were traditionalists. Much odder that they had not moved Earth further out from the growing heat of Jupiter. What concerned Corbell was this. He could not take a world 20 degrees colder, not without clothing, and an endless night might drive him mad. Soup odors were beginning to permeate the wood smoke. This sense of urgency was silly. He had a year to get moving. He could make foraging expeditions to the edge of the city, keep his camp here. Whatever was out beyond the domes, it had to be keep important. Keep left. How dangerous could it be? It might well be thousands of square miles of Seresh Zillish Park. An endless vacation, and he could use it. In his second life, Corbell Mark II had suffered enough future shock to kill a whole city full of Alvin Tufflers. Tomorrow, then, he could take the car as far as the hospital. It was near a standing fragment of dome. Then into the wild, with spear and drumstick over either shoulder, if the drumstick kept that long without refrigeration. He remembered to scrape some of his fire into his trash can fireplace. He stretched out on the warm granite. Warm rain hammered at him. He turned over fast, rose to hands and knees, and popped out a tablespoonful of rainwater. First time that had happened. His bonfire must be out, but had the soup cooked first? Was rain getting into his fireplace? He looked up and forgot all of these crucial questions. A dozen or so boys, approximately a big Boy Scout crew, but uniformed only in breech clouds, squatted in a circle around Corbell and his fire. They were passing around a drumstick bone, nearly clean by now, while they watched him, as if they had been watching him in perfect silence for hours. Their hair was rich, for they had hair. On some it was black and woolly, on others black and straight, dripping to their shoulders. The crowns of their heads were bald, but for a single tuft on the forehead. They ignored the pounding rain and watched, half smiling. I should have known, said Corbell. The cattails, they're half tame. All right, he made a sweeping gesture. Welcome to the kingdom of Corbell for himself. Have some soup. They frowned, all of them. One got up, a long, lanky boy, a budding basketball player, Corbell would have judged. He spoke. Sorry, said Corbell. The boy spoke again, command and anger. That was no boy's voice, though it was high-pitched. Corbell was hardly surprised. These were the boys, merely Lyra's immortals. I don't speak your language, Corbell said slowly, with an instinct that went against sense. The natives will understand if you speak slowly and clearly. The boy came forward and slapped him across the face. Corbell hit him flush in the mouth. His right cross hit ribs instead of solar plexus and the following left missed completely, somehow. Then the whole circle converged on him. His memory thereafter was a little hazy. There was weight on his knees and forearms, granite ground into his back. The basketball star sat on his chest and spoke the same sentence over and over through a split lip. He would say it, and wait, and slap Corbell twice, and say it again. Corbell replied with obscenities. He could feel the bruises now. The tall boy got off his chest. He said something to the others. They all frowned down at Corbell. They discussed the matter in complex consonants, spat like mouthfuls of watermelon seeds. Corbell's head still rang. It had been beaten against granite. 
Four boys were still sitting on his forearms and knees. Rain splashed in his eyes. It all tended to muddle his thinking. Did they think he was a strayed dictator? But Corbell was showing his age. They couldn't. Wrong. No dictator immortality here. The dictators must grow old, as Corbell had grown old. The discussion ended. Four boys got off Corbell. He sat up, rubbing his arms. One took a theatrical pose, pointed at the ground before him, and spat one harsh word. Stay, or heal. His message was plain, and Corbell was in no shape to run. The tall boy still studied Corbell as if trying to make up his mind. The others clustered around Corbell's soup pot. They scooped soup into halves of coconut shells. The tall boy finally offered him something else, a ceramic cup from his belt. Corbell waited for room, then moved in. He sat, gingerly favoring the bruises, and drank. Cattails moved among the tribe like a plague of snakes, rubbed against ankles, and were petted, tore at the raw turkey carcass, what was left of it. Corbell felt fur against his ankles. He stroked a pure black cattail. A rumbling vibration went through his shin. Now we say that Corbell has been captured again? Or, Corbell asked himself, shall we say that fate has given me guides through Antarctica? Put that way, the decision was easy. Three. The soloist sang in a strong, rich tenor. He sang to background music, eight boys humming in at least four parts, one more beating with turkey bones on Corbell's trash can fireplace. Alien music, improvised, overly complex against the simple melancholy tune. Corbell listened open-mouthed, the back of his neck tingling. He had feared this, and it was true. Three million years had increased human intelligence. The night after his capture, he had tried singing as a way to enhance his entertainment value. Since then, he had sung medleys of advertising jingles or theme songs for movies, or the clean and dirty folk songs he and Mirabel had sung on the boat, songs three million years out of date. But the boys liked them. They didn't like it when he repeated a song they'd heard before. He wondered why, but he obeyed their wishes. Oh, we got a new computer, but it's quite a disappointment, Catalus was saying, because it always gives the same insane advice. Oh, you need little teeny eyes for reading little teeny print like you need little teeny hands for milking mice. The flavor or mockery in his singing was for Corbell. He couldn't know what the words meant, but his pronunciation was accurate. Corbell had sung that song once. Beside him was the boy who had attacked him that night a week ago, the leader in some respects. Skettles was broad of nose and lip, woolly-haired, long-limbed, and emaciated-looking. He might have been a black preteen but for the partial baldness and the prison pallor he shared with the others. He said in English, He sings well, do you think? And laughed at what he found in Corbell's face. Now you know. You remember everything. Everything. Even whole songs in another language. Yes. You need to learn my speaking more than I need to learn your speaking, but I learn yours first. This is why. You are different, Corbell. Older. I think you are older than anything. Almost anything. I will teach you how to talk. When you tell your tale, we all want to listen. I make a mistake with you. Do you know why I hit you? We thought you were only a dick who broke with rules. You did not... Scatholtz jumped suddenly to his feet. He stood at parade rest for a moment. Then he shrank back, hands raised half in supplication, half to ward a blow. I didn't cringe, said Corbell. Yes, cringe. It is a formal show of respect. Catullus sang. So we got an expert genius, and he rewrote all the programs, but we always got results that looked like these. Oh, you need little teeny eyes for reading little teeny print, like you need little teeny license plates for bees. It was pink and black dusk in the park. The boys had returned early this day. They spent most of every day in Serash Zilish, going through buildings like a flock of wild birds, exploring, Corbell had thought, savages swarming through ruins they could not understand. He'd soon lost that illusion. 
A pair of boys had escorted him outside the hospital operating room while the others worked inside. When he was allowed back in, Corbell's scalpel spear had been reattached. The many jointed arms above the operating table were carefully carving a phantom patient. He was not allowed to watch repairs, but he had seen the results. The refrigerator in the police building restored. A factory tested, run through its cycle until it had built two phone booths. The boys did Corbell the signal honor of letting him test the booths. He had not tried to balk. Another factory had produced a bathroom, a complete unit with pool and sauna. The boys had repaired and tested the city lighting. Now the sides of many buildings glowed with soft yellow-white light. Others remained dark. The effect was eerie, a city-sized chessboard. They lived like savages, but apparently it was from choice. In camp, Corbell had done his share of the work, hauling firewood and digging up roots. They had given him a loincloth, but they would not give him a knife to replace his scalpel spear. He still didn't know what place he held among them. He feared the worst. They were too intelligent. They would see him as a lesser being, an animal. He needed them. It wasn't just company he needed. He could not travel safely until he knew something about this new continent. The boy was singing all the verses to the muted laughter of his companions. Corbell said, Sooner or later, I'll run out of songs. Sooner. Scatholds shrugged. It is all the same. We leave here when light comes again. We go to other... tribes? To tell them that Serash Zidish is ready for the long night. You come with us. Night? Is it night that's coming? Had he landed in bottom then? Yes. So, you came from space, unready. I thought that. Yes, the long day is ended, and the short day nights are with us, and the long night comes near. In the long night, we live in the city. Hunters go to the forests around, and food will keep in the cold boxes. In day, we live more as we like. Never mind. What's it like I'll find there? a new route. You will see. Scatholes picked up a passing cattail and stroked its fur. Go straight on. We have time to teach you some speaking, he said, and he switched to the language Corbell had tagged boyish. Corbell was agreeable. He enjoyed language lessons. Morning. They moved out. There was incredibly little fuss. They all seemed to wake at once. Soup had been simmering all night, made to Corbell's recipe, which they liked. Breakfast was soup and coconut shells. They picked up pots, cloth, the fire starter, half a dozen edged weapons. One, an albino boy with pink eyes and cottony golden hair, handed Corbell twenty pounds of jerked meat wrapped in cloth. They left. Corbell woke fully, marching the rest of the way. He had to drive himself to keep up, though the boys made no attempt to set a steady pace. They ambled. Some dodged into buildings, then jogged to rejoin the tribe. Savages, they were not. They carried an idiosyncratic variety of edge tools, no two alike. Scimitars, machetes, sabers, shapes that had no name, all with carefully sculpted handles. They had made the jerky the way Corbell would have, in an oven set on low. The cloth they carried was indestructible stuff as thin as fine silk. Crayhaft's flashlight fire starter projected light of variable intensity, in a conical beam or a beam no thicker than a pencil. Organized, they were not, but they had broken camp in minutes. They tramped through the silent streets. Ingrowths of jungle grew thicker about them until the city became jungle. They passed a straight tree trunk that Corbell suddenly realized was vine-wrapped metal. He looked up to see where it joined other members in a hexagonal array, a part of the old dome. The jungle bore fruit, small oranges, breadfruit, several kinds of nuts. The boys ate as they walked and picked raw nuts to replace the roasted nuts they carried. They talked among themselves. Corbell couldn't follow their conversation and went too fast. He strode along in their midst, keeping the pace he'd set himself. Incredible the way his old body had healed. Tomorrow, the aches would come. Tomorrow, he might not be able to move, except he'd damn well better. Today, he felt fine. He felt like a scoutmaster leading his troop. Memo, don't test your authority. Three hours or so into the hike, and that could almost be a fight developing up ahead. 
Scatholtz and another boy were spitting syllables at each other with unwanted vehemence. Last night's singer loped to join them. Catalas was a burly, big-chested boy with Scatholtz's black man's features and everybody's pale skin. He snapped Keep one left. word at the two and they shut up. Catalas looked about him, frowned, pointed. The troop went off in that direction. They found a clearing, a few bushes growing on otherwise bare ground. Corbell watched, not understanding, as the troop formed a circle and Scatholtz and the other boys stepped into it. What was this? A duel? The two dropped their knives and breech clouds. No pubic hair. They circled like wrestlers. The challenger kicked at Scatholtz's heart. Scatholtz swerved clear, and now it was happening too fast to follow. Fists and feet and elbows struck to kill. A momentary hold broken by an elbow between the eyes. The challenger kicked off balance and hand springing clear. Scatholtz jumping full over a bush and then using it as a shield. It looked like a damned dance. But Scatholtz was favoring one leg, and the other boy was circling faster. He was going to run him down. He caught a kick in the face as he closed. Scatholtz moved in for the kill. Catalus barked one word. The bloody-nosed boy cringed before Scatholtz, held the pose a moment, then straightened. Everyone got up and started moving again. Someone else was carrying Scatholtz's cumbersome pack of cloth. His opponent was grinning and wiping in a bloody nose. In mid-afternoon, Scatholtz said two words Corbell recognized. He said, Stop talk. They did. Now, the silence of their march was uncanny. Scatholtz dropped back to walk beside Corbell. Very quietly, he said, in boyish. You walk too loudly. I can't help it. Are we hiding from something? From dinner, we hide. Earlier was too early. We did not want to carry food so far. If something moves, let me know. Corbell nodded. He didn't expect to see anything. It would be months before his brain could train his eyes to see what the boys could see in familiar territory. The keen-eyed Indian sees things the white man can't, but only in his own environment. Two boys transferred their loads to others and slipped away. Corbell couldn't see where they had gone, but presently there was a weird and terrifying sound, like a clarinet screaming for help. Every boy instantly moved off the trail to flatten against a tree. Corbell copied them. The tortured clarinet sounded nearer. They heard branches snapping. What would emerge? A tentacled monster? Descendant of aliens enslaved by a younger, space-traveling state? The monster burst from the trees. It was crippled, its forelegs running blood, hamstrung. The boys followed it, first the hunters and then the rest, slashing at its hind legs. A baby elephant. Corbell caught up in time to see it die. It was murder. It left him sick to his stomach. He fought his squeamishness and moved close to examine the corpse. The beast was wrinkled and marked by old scars. No baby this. It was an adult elephant, four feet tall at the shoulder. He asked Scaffolds, Can I help? You may not butcher. I cannot let you touch a knife. You are not a dick, Corbell. You are nothing we know. Today I kill nobody. He meant it as a joke, but he didn't know enough boyish to phrase or inflect it that way. Scatholt said, And tomorrow? I think you make fiction to entertain, but lives might end if I am wrong. Do you understand my speech? I will learn. He knew that Scatholt was using baby talk for his benefit. Do you know the chkint? Elephant. When I was young, they were bigger, higher than your head at the shoulder. He wondered how elephants had come to Antarctica. Not as meat animals, surely. Maybe there had been a zoo. Scatholtz looked dubious. There are larger beasts in the sea, but how could such a beast live on land without support? Still, I have wondered why the elephant's legs are so thick. Was it to support larger weight? Yes, the legs were more thick when I was young. The beast was the biggest on land. Five million years ago, he had divided by twelve for Jupiter years. There were beasts far larger. We have found the bones turned to rock in the earth. Scatholtz laughed skeptically and left him. Having finished butchering the elephant, they departed. 
Corbell carried a rack of ribs for a while, but it slowed him down. A disgusted tribesman finally took it away from him. The forest ended. Far across a prairie of waving yellowish-red vegetation, Corbell saw a last sliver of the departing sun. Jupiter was a pinkish-white disk, rising. Here they made camp. Presently, Corbell ate roasted elephant for the first time in his life. He was too tired to sing for his supper. Someone was telling a story. It was Crayhaven, who had oriental eyes and gleaming white patches in his straight black hair. And the others were listening in intense concentration when Corbell dropped off to sleep. They tramped all the next day through waving pinkish-yellow grain. Corbell judged it wheat. Who grows this? He asked Scatholds, and was answered with laughter. Wheat took cultivation, didn't it? Maybe it had been gene-altered. Four gene-altered cats still lived among the tribe. They took their turns riding the necks of various tribesmen. A wheat that grew wild would be worth having, more useful than a cat that was all tail. All day, Corbell saw kangaroos and ostriches bounding through the wheat. They were fast and wary. Once, there was a lone man with a spear far ahead, a pale figure at a dead run behind a fleeing ostrich. The pair was long gone when the tribe got there. Late in the day, Crayhaped found the tracks of something large. The tribe followed. Near sunset, their quarry came in sight, a big shambling mass that ran from them on four legs until it turned at bay on two. It was a bear. Its skin was hairless and yellow, but for a mane of thick white fur. A nude polar bear? And no dwarf, either. It waddled toward the hunters and tried to maul them with its great claws. But it was fighting Homo superior in the prime of health and youth. They danced around it, slashing. It fought on long after it should have bled to death. They ate bear meat that night, while the cattails hunted at the edge of firelight. Jupiter was full, banded and orange. Corbell was dozing with a full belly when Catullus dropped beside him. He spoke slowly, enunciating. Do you sing tonight? If I choose, then no. Acceptable. What was this about growing grain? The grain we used didn't grow without human help. Like Scatholtz, I do not read your face well. If this is fiction for entertainment, you do it well. We will be sorry to lose you. How do you lose me? The boy might mean only that Dicta dies sooner or later, like cattails. No. Catullus said, When we reach the Dicta, we lose you. Corbell hadn't counted on that. How many days? Four. Five if we stop for amusement somewhere. You will like the Dicta, Corbell. There are men and women, and the making of new boys between them. They have a city and some country around, but they are not smart enough to make the machines go. In day, we fix the things that go wrong at night. They're not smart enough? They're the same kind you are. Their heads should be built the same. They have the brain, the stuff inside the heads, just like us. They do not have the time. We do not tell them how to fix machines. They do not live long enough to learn, and they might break the machines learning, and we punish them if they leave. So they stay in the dicta place. They need us. We know where to find them. We must know this, because we must bring new boys to the tribes. What happens to the small ones, not boys? The girls? They grow. Some boys grow too. We choose the best, the smartest, and the strongest, one from each tribe for each year and we send them back to the Dicta. We do not do the thing to them that makes them stay the same forever. Planned breeding for superior boys, and it would tend to cow the young Turks to the benefit of the leaders. Corbell said, there must be a lot more women than men. Catullus grinned. You like that? Anger tied his tongue. You, you joke. I die of being too old soon. I can't make more boys. Catullus had Corbell by the hair. His knife was drawn. Before Corbell could do more than gasp, he slashed, slashed away a thick handful of Corbell's hair and held it before his eyes. Your lies are for the newly born. We are offended, he said. Can you lie as to this? 
The thin white hair he held in firelight was dark brown for half an inch at the roots. Corbell gaped. The tribe surrounded him. They must have been listening all the time. Yes, they looked offended. Scatholt said, No dict grows hair like that. You have found the dict a way to live long like boys that we know only in tales. We must know what and where it is. Corbell had forgotten his boyish, every word. In English, he cried, I haven't the remotest idea. Catullus slapped him. Corbell tried to block with his arms. Wait, wait, you're right. I must have taken dicta immortality. I just don't know where. Maybe, maybe it's in something I ate. The dicta did a lot of gene engineering. They made the cattails and the wild wheat. Maybe they made something that grows dicta immortality. Something that grows in Seresh Zilish. Listen, I didn't know what was happening. I can't see my own hair. Scatholtz was gesturing the rest back. You could not feel your youth returning? I thought I was getting adapted to the rough life. I spent like 130 years in a cold sleep tank, 10 years at a time. My years, not yours. I couldn't know what it did to me. Listen, there's an old woman who's been searching every city in the world for dicta immortality. If she doesn't know, how could I? We know nothing of this woman. All right, Corbell, tell your story. Leave nothing out. He had been sleepy. Now he was scared boneless and still bone weary. And in that state, Corbell told his life story. Whenever he paused for breath, Scatholt spat complex phrases in boyish, translating. Telling savages about a black hole at the center of a galaxy was easier than he had expected. Telling merely Lyra's tale was wearing. They kept backing him up for points she hadn't mentioned, for points she hadn't even noticed in her thirst for dictator immortality. They found her lack of curiosity incomprehensible. Questions. What had he eaten, drunk, breathed? Could immortality have been in the bath in one city? It was a mistake to mention the fountain of youth. But no, the dicta themselves used baths. Dawn came and Corbell was still talking. It could have been any of the things I tried. The fruits, the nuts, the roots, the meat, the soup even. I mean, the combination of a lot of things, plus the heat. Hell, it could have been in the water in the fountain. Scatholt stood and stretched. We can find out. When we return to Seresh Zilish, we will take a dict. Shall we go? Go? Corbell saw that the other boys were getting up, collecting gear. Oh, please, I'll fall over. You are stronger than you think, Corbell. For too long, you were a dict, sick with age. They marched. The wheat-covered quarry went on forever. They camped early, after Finding the afternoon Finding a new rain. route. Corbell sprawled in the wet earth and slept like a dead man. Four. He woke early. A cattail had crawled along his ribs, liking the warmth, Rerouting. tickling him. It mewed in protest as he rolled away. There was more protest left, from his overused and then muscles. Turn left. The fire had died. Jupiter, white with a thin turn red left. crescent edge, made the night seem bright. Well, I'm in trouble again, he thought. Imagine my amazement. Everyone in the world wants dictator immortality, and they all think I've got it, and they're all half right. Why do the boys want it? Maybe they want to destroy it. It's the biggest difference between them and the dicta. He let his hand stroke the orange cattail. It draped itself over his knee and rumbled contentedly. What is it? If it's edible, it's in Serash Zilish. Everything I ate in Four City. Merely Lyra ate two. One kind for women and one for men. And man's immortality doesn't affect women at all? I don't believe it. So something in the park holds dictator immortality in the sap or the juice or the blood, and I ate it. What did she eat when she searched Serash Zilish? The boys eat almost no vegetables, and vegetarians eat no meat, but she fed me both, and fruit too. Insects? I don't eat insects. If I could get her to Serash Zilish, I'd know. Watch her, see what she doesn't eat. The stars were bright tonight. A few unwinking stars had a pinkish tinge, small Jovian moons. 
The boys were sprawled far from where the fire had been. A boy on guard looked around as Corbell sat up. It was Crayhaven, the only boy Keep with white left, in his hair. And then turn left. Heady smells reached Corbell. Wet earth and growing things. Traces of young supermen turn who hadn't washed recently. A ghost of broiled meat that Corbell hadn't shared. Suddenly he was hungry. And suddenly he was elated. What the hell am I complaining about? He whispered. The okay. cattail stopped. Growing. Let's find a new route. I'm young. If nothing else works, I can outrun the bitch. I should be Never dancing mind. in the streets. I'll find a if new I route. Find a street. Young again. That made twice. If he could find out how he did it, he could stay young Finding for the rest of his new life. Route. Everybody's dream. And even if he couldn't, the grin died on his face. Now he had fifty years to protect. Half a century of lifespan that the Norn would rip from him if he couldn't show her the tree of life in Sarash Zilish. Something that tasted funny? Everything tasted funny. Different soil. Three million years of change. It was too damn simple anyway. Immortality? And you drink it like fruit juice? An injection might have been more plausible, if he had received any kind of injection. Or had he inhaled it like marijuana, in the smoke from the wood of a carefully gene-tailored tree. Corbell, do you enjoy the morning? Corbell jumped violently. The sentry's approach had been perfectly silent. He settled beside Corbell. By Jupiter light, the pale threads gleamed in his hair. Corbell had wondered at the grace with which he moved. Crayhave, who carried the fire starter. Crayhave, the storyteller. How old are you? Twenty-one, said Crayhave. That's old, said Corbell. Jupiter years. I wonder why you aren't the leader. The old ones learn to avoid that chore, and to avoid the fighting that goes with it. Scatholtz can beat me. Skill Keep in right fighting has an upper limit. Exit right. One is born with one's greatest possible strength. Oh. Corbell, exit I think I have right. found your spacecraft. What? There. The boy was pointing low on the northern horizon, where a few stars glowed in the gray black of coming dawn. One showed pink among blue-tinged stars. The one that might be a moon, except that it does not move. Is that your spacecraft? No. I don't know where my ship went. Don Juan wasn't ball-like. It would look more like a thick spear. Crayhape was more puzzled than disappointed. Then what is it? I have seen it twinkle oddly. It does not move, but it grows more bright every night. The whole system of worlds is messed up. I can't explain it. I think that's the next world out from Jupiter. I wish it had been your spacecraft, said Crayhave. He fell to studying the steady point of light, and pranced. The cattail slithered from Corbell's knee and disappeared into the grain. Corbell saw two more low shadows slipping after it. A cat screamed. Simultaneously, something much bigger vented a much lower, coughing roar. Crayhave Keep shouted, left. Alert! It bounded out of the grain and leapt at Corbell's throat, something as big as the biggest of dogs. Corbell threw himself to the side. He saw a spear plant itself solidly in the open mouth, and then the boys were on it. It was a dwarf lion, male, magnificently made. It died fast. Even the first spear might Corbell got up, shaken. The female could be out there. Stathold said, Yes and join the others who were fanning out into the grain. Corbell, spearless and superfluous, stayed where he was. Presently, he noticed something small in the path the lion's charge had left through grain. He found a small butterscotch Sunday corpse. The other cattails had returned to the fire. They seemed unusually subdued. At dawn, he helped two boys build the fire. He saw the reason later, when four more trekked in with ostrich eggs. They set the eggs on the coals, carefully cut the tops off, and stirred the contents with spear halves. Scrambled eggs. Still no coffee. Corbell strode along in pink sunlight, feeling good. The slapping around was a bitter memory, with bruises to corroborate it. But he set next to it another memory, Catalysp's fist holding white hair with dark brown roots. Oh, for a mirror. He was a slave, if not worse, but he was young with an outside chance to stay that way a long time. 
They had crossed a row of big, badly weathered rocks, oddly textured, big as houses and bigger. Now the land sloped down, and Corbell found Scatholtz marching beside him. Scatholtz said in English, What do you know of the girls? There was a boyish word for girl-child, and another for dicta woman, but girl was a third word, and it carried a certain emphasis. Corbell answered, Merely Lyra told me something about them. There was a balance of power between boys and girls, and somehow it fell apart. By her tale, the girls ruled boys as boys ruled dicta. No. Look at it with more care. The girls ruled the sky. They could move the world. By implication, they controlled the weather. They could decide how far the world should be from the sun. In fact, they first moved the world because the sun was getting too hot. The boys ruled the dicta. They could see to it that no more boys or girls were born. An interesting role reversal, that. In itself, that isn't a lot of power. Not in a crowded world where everyone expects to live forever anyway. But our land was less rich. The tales tell it so. Yeah. Look at it from the other direction. Suppose the boys let the dicta breed like rabbits. Breed fast. They kill most of the girl children and hide most of the boy children. The boy children grow up. They get dicta immortality as long as they behave. Now the boys have an army. They invade. The land had leveled out. Ahead, it sloped upward again. Scatholtz molded over, then... Our tales tell nothing of this. That's because it never happened. The boys couldn't feed such an army. Poor land. So the balance of power lasted, oh, tens of thousands of your years. I see, partly. I am not used to thinking like this. What went wrong? Somehow the girls lost control. Yeah. Weather? Our tales tell of a great thawing. When green things grew for the first time in our land, the girls tried to take it. The thaw happened when the girls grew too proud. In their pride, they lost a the moon, and with the moon, they lost their power. Corbell laughed. They lost a moon? Hey, just how accurate could these tales be after a hundred thousand years? We live long. We remember well. Details may be lost, but we do not add fiction. The land sloped upward. In the distance, Corbell could see another line of big, melted-looking rocks. The moon. It sounds completely silly, but... Pierce told me the moons of Jupiter were out of their orbits. But that's not too strange. Dropping the world into their midst could have done that. But he also said Ganymede is missing completely. Ganymede? The biggest moon. Hell, I don't see how it fits in. And the sun is too hot, you said. And King Jupiter is too hot. And the weather is screwed up, said Corbell. It all comes down to a change in the weather. It wiped out the balance of power. Then the boys wiped out the girls. We tell tales of that war. Weapons as strong as a meteor strike. Look, Corbell, such a weapon was used here. Scatholt swept an arm behind it. They had crossed a shallow, dish-shaped depression a couple of miles across, rimmed by these half-melted... Just a minute, said Corbell. He dropped his load of jerky and scrambled up a rock twenty feet high and of oddly uniform texture. There at the top, he found lines of rust red marking a great Z, the remains of a girder. These were buildings, he said. It must have been a boy city. When I was young, I wanted to use weapons like that. Scatholt laughed boyishly. Now I cringe at what they must have done to the weather. But we destroyed the girls. They did use some hurt, too. Corbell climbed down from the melted building. They'd have to trot to catch up with the tribe. The tale tells that they destroyed us, said Scatholtz. I never understood that saying. Corbell and Scatholtz marched on in silence for a time. Boys chattered ahead. It was just past noon, too early to hunt. Very far away, a great brown carpet flowed away from the noise they were making. Thousands of animals too distant to recognize, too numerous to count. Scatholt said in boyish, Soon we reach the border to the great water. A day's march broad is that border. The word is... Corbell learned the words for sure 
and see. The new village holds a pleasant surprise, and Scaffolds used another unfamiliar word. I can't describe it. We must do work for it. All right. In his youth, Corbell had never liked muscle work. But oh, it was good to have the muscles now. He asked, why were we talking English? Because I must know you. I must learn when you are telling fiction. Corbell chose not to protest the injustice. I wonder about the cattails. What do you wonder? In Sarash Zilish, they rule. Here, there are things bigger and more violent. How can they live? Soon or late, a predator kills them. Until then, they are pleasant to keep near. Soon or late, everything dies, except boys. Before this evil, you control your rage skillfully. Will we find more cattails among the dicta? No, we never leave cattails with the dicta. Why? It isn't done. Corbell let it drop. There was a thing he dared not ask you, but he would have to find out. How carefully were the adults guarded? The dicta place was the second place Mirali Lyron would look for. He couldn't stay long. The moment she saw him, dark hair, that moment he would have to produce dictator immortality. And maybe he could. One simple test, made carefully. He did not want the boys chopping down the tree of life. Five. They reached the village at noon. It was a strange blend of primitive and futuristic, an arc of baths identical to the bath Corbell had found by the shore in one city, half surrounding the village square and surrounded in turn by sod huts and granaries. There was great variety among the sod structures, but they matched. The village as a whole was beautiful. Corbell was beginning to get the idea. The ancient factories would build the boys' buildings for certain purposes. It was very easy to go on using them century after century. For other purposes, they made their own, and lavished labor and ingenuity on them. He was not entirely surprised when Crayhaft spoke for the tribe, and called it Crayhaft's tribe. He who spoke for the village had Crayhaft's strange grace, and gray in his long golden hair. They worked all that afternoon. A couple of boys of the village went with them to supervise, shouting their orders with malice aforethought. Corbell and Crayhaft's tribe used primitive scythes to reap grain from the fields and carry it in bundles into the village square, until there was a great heap of it there, until the boys of the village were satisfied. After their labor, the boys went whooping to the baths. Corbell waited his turn with impatience. He went the full route, bath and steam and sauna and back to the bath, this time with the jacuzzi-style bubble system turned on. When he emerged, it was dark. They were starting dinner. The surprise Scatholtz had promised was bread, of course. Several kinds of bread, plus rabbit meat the villagers had hunted. Corbell ate his fill of all the varieties of bread. The taste brought on a nostalgic mood. His eyes were wet when Catalus had finished singing Corbell's version of Poisoning Pigeons in the Park. The bread had surprised him less than the phone booth at one end of the Ark of Baths. He dithered but Scatholtz knew he knew about phone booths. While Crayhaft started one of his long tales, Corbell sought out Scatholtz and asked him. The skeletal boy grinned. Were you thinking of leaving us through the palazzo? Not especially. Of course not. Well, you've guessed right. This village trades their grain for other bread makings all across the land. I didn't think the palazzo would send anything that far. The land is crossed by a line of palazzo, close-spaced. Do you think we would handle emergencies by traveling on foot? Look. Scatholtz drew a ragged circle, Antarctica, and a peace symbol across it. If there were serious reason to travel, these lines of palazzo exist. Since the time of the girls, they have been used four times, more if tales have been lost. We keep them in repair. Corbell kept the other questions to himself. He hoped he would not have to use the palazzo. They were too obvious. They would be guarded. When the tribe left in the morning, they carried Keep loaves left. of bread in their cloth bags. There had been an exchange. Three of Crayhaft's tribe had stayed behind, and three villagers had replaced them. No big deal was made of it. And Corbell had to examine faces Keep to left. be sure it had happened. Now there was no more grain. 
the land dropped gradually for 20 miles or more and ended in mist. Nothing grew on it but dry scrub. Off to the right of their path was a cluster of sharp-edged shapes, promontories all alone on the flat, lifeless ground. Nature sometimes imitates that regular, artificial look. Corbell asked anyway. They are artificial, Scaffolds told him. Keep right, I have seen them and before. then turn right. I have my guess as to what they are, but shall we look at them? Some of Crayhaith's tribe have not seen them. Turn right. The troop veered. The structures grew larger. Some lay on their sides, disintegrating. Keep right. But the nearest stood upright, its narrow bottom firmly set in the ground. The tribe clustered beneath a great curved wall, leaning out over their heads. Ships, said Corbell. They carried people and things over water. What are they doing so far from the ocean? Perhaps there was ocean here once. Yeah, yeah. Go straight on. When the world on. got so hot, a lot of the ocean went into the air. This used to be sea bottom mud, I think. Crayhaft said. That fits with the tale. Can you guess Keep what they might right. have carried? Too many answers. Is there a way in? He didn't understand when Crayhaft untied the fire starter from his belt. He would have stopped him otherwise. Crayhaft twisted something on the fire starter, pointed it at the great wall of rusted metal. The metal flared. Corbell said nothing. It was already too late. He watched the thin blue beam spurt fire until Crayhaft had cut a wide door. The metal slab fell away. Tons of mud spilled after it. Eons of dust and rainwater. They waded up the mud slope, choking among themselves, and Corbell followed. The hull was one enormous tank. There were no partitions to prevent sloshing. Corbell sniffed, but no trace of the cargo remained. Oil? Or something more exotic? or only topsoil for the frigid Antarctic cities. Topsoil wouldn't slosh around. The surprise was on deck and above deck. Masts. There was no place here for human sailors. There were only proliferating masts, reminiscent of clipper ships, and cables all running to a great housing at the bow, a housing for motors and winches and a computer. The hull had appeared to be sound. The masts were in fine shape, but time had reduced the computer to garbage. That was a pity. It was as big as Don Juan's computer, which had housed Pierce's personality. Conceivably, it could have told them a great deal. They marched down into the fog, and the fog swallowed them. Corbell heard regular booming sounds that he failed to interpret. Then suddenly, they had reached the sea. Breakers roared and hissed across a rocky shore. They rested. Then, while others collected brush for a fire, Three of the boys swam out into the breakers with spears and the rope. It looked inviting. The water would not be cold. But Corbell had seen the boys hunt, and he wondered what toothy prey waited for them. Two came back. They swam ashore with the rope twitching behind them and collapsed, panting heavily, while others dragged the rope in with its thrashing burden. They beached twelve feet of shark. The third boy didn't come back. Corbell couldn't believe it. How could immortals be so careless of their lives? The boys were subdued, but they held no kind of formal ceremony. Corbell ate bread that night. He had no stomach for shark. He had seen what came out of the shark's stomach. He lay long awake, puzzling it out. He had been old and young and middle-aged, in no intelligible sequence. With any luck, he would stay young. He had fought for his life and his lifestyle against the massed might of the state. He had never given up, not with all the excuse in the world. Did they get tired of too much life? Corbell didn't doubt that they could build machines to kill off the sharks. The factories that kept turning out identical bedrooms and baths and offices were a tribute to their laziness, but they were also brilliant. Then why were the sharks still here? Tradition? Machismo? In the morning, the boys were cheerful as ever. In the afternoon, they reached the dicta.